gaming news. <laughs> I don't know a better intro for this video. I'm sorry. <laughs> nah, it's fine. Cause we, when we were discussing this discussion point, it was like months ago. I think when E3 was coming out, we thought, let's talk about all this cool stuff we're learning that's coming out during E3. But then, of course, because schedules, things got delayed. And now, like all this new stuff is coming up. And even while we were setting the date for it, uh, it just continuously new gaming news is just hey. constantly releasing. It's the universe correcting the karmic scale almost. <laughs> I, I don't know. Yeah, about so you. Where should, I don't know about you, yeah, but where do you want to start? I think the Activision leaks is a good place to start because that was insane. <laughs> right. So like to set the stage for anyone listening um, who may not be aware, basically, uh, Microsoft like has this huge acquisition for Activision Blizzard, which like it isn't big in terms of the fact that it's the biggest ever because like Tencent is out here doing way more crazy things, but it is still a very large company buying another large company, which of course got a bunch of legal uh, establishments involved, some of which who are just cool with it, like I think in Brazil and South America basically, but then in Europe and America, we kind of made it a little harder for them to avoid uh, monopoly concerns. Um, and you know, all the politics of that aside, uh, because uh, Microsoft has to defend their de business decisions in court, they had to submit a bunch of documents, and some of those documents got released, and while a couple of them were redacted, others were very much not redacted, entire PDFs fully on display <laughs> with, like, no concern to it. It's like, oh, we don't have to worry about anybody reading this, but as it turns out, Microsoft shared it with an unsecure link, and so that's why it ended up leaking out to the internet. It wasn't because the FTC was like losing their case or some major conspiracy. It's just somebody, a bunch of people made mistakes and someone likely got fired. Somebody definitely got fired. It was whole business proceedings for like the next generation of Microsoft consoles. It was a bunch of the projected release dates pre-COVID obviously. For Bethesda's projects while they were in the process of buying them because it was like documents were like here here is our prime uh, target for you know acquisition of us we got a doom on the way we got a new dishonored title coming out we had redfall we had a couple elder scrolls expansions etc 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 and you know me being a huge elder scrolls fan I, who doesn't give a shit about like um eso I, i'm not an mmo person at all really I try to be and it's it's hard because when there's no distinct like object objective in the game for like initial plot points i'm like the fuck do i do it's like me trying to play minecraft once a year <laughs> um but i saw all that i'm like okay let's go through here you got like a fallout 3 remaster on there an oblivion remaster which we kind of already knew was a thing and then we had like a projected date of next year for ES uh, ES six. Obviously, that got pushed back because they just announced it was going into the early stages of development. But that was a huge one for me as a Bethesda fan, um, especially as a Doom fan. Like a new Doom, please give me more. Uh, <laughs> but like that was really cool to see. I I realized like how bad business wise that is, and, and it, seeing Phil Spencer would be just like, yeah, that happened. <laughs> Oh, like unsecure shit happened and um like it comes with this whole case but it was like something i think they said like multiple terabytes worth of data just were out there in the public <laughs> hey I, yeah it was it was a good day for me to decide to not go to bed <laughs> just because i was still like up like deciding if i wanted to go to sleep or not just saw all this coming out, and I'm at first. I have to be like, okay, this seems too good to be true. That was my first thought, honestly, because like you don't usually get these leaks at this kind of level. It's normally like someone heard a rumor behind some backdoor mm -hmm. dealing, or like people anonymously are saying things to avoid getting in trouble, but somehow still wanting the attention. 
Like rumors are usually like that, and some are true. Some my are uncle this. works for Nintendo. It's the classic one. <laughs> yeah, that one. I mean, I always felt like that was more of like playground talk. But uh, yeah, I think with this one, once you saw like the level of detail with these documents and the sources they were coming from, it's like, yeah, no, this is reputable. Especially because like the source was <laughs> the U.S. government. Right. So I'm pulling um, up your and, post from um, the Discord here. Because oh, okay. uh, I'm not sure which post you're referring to, so let's see. So it's like the the refresh mid gen that also got leaked and all of that is. I am. And so, it just links to Wario's post of all the crap that got leaked, so that's perfect. Um. Yep. Um. Yeah, I didn't have it in front of me, so that's a good thing you have that. Because like, uh, what I wanted to say with this is, it was like pre twenty. Uh, well, it was around 2020 time, all this information. And like, yes, Phil said, things have changed. So we don't know which projects are in here besides the one we know that got delayed or like still in development. And of mm. course, there's new things that got into development since then. And there was like a whole year where Microsoft just didn't even release any first party titles. So, you know, some stuff was going wrong there since this information was out. But I think the things that I was most interested in uh, besides what you already talked about, Vex, was uh, one, there was a sequel set up for Ghost of Tsushima. I might not be saying that right, but uh, I can see that still in development just because that project has been pretty successful. So I'm mm -hmm. glad for that. I like it when new IPs are getting a like, good amount oh, yeah. of investment because we were talking about Horizon a little last time just because mm -hmm. the announcement of their uh, complete edition coming to Steam and whatnot. And, you know, um, I uh, really enjoyed it when it first came out. It wasn't the most unique in terms of gameplay, but I like the aesthetic and I like the fact that I like when new IP are coming out and not just the exact same thing, even if they have to borrow the format of older oh, yeah. uh, games to, like, help it succeed. Because I, I understand that, but I'd at least like it, things to be new from major studios because if we... Otherwise, we're just going to creatively stagnate if we just start investing in sequels constantly. Looking to Hollywood um, and its endless, just platefuls of fucking remakes right now. Like, yeah, I mean, I guess uh, the Barbie Oppenheimer phenomenon <laughs> might help us get some crazy new stuff, I'm hoping. I hope. But, um... But, um yeah, the other thing, the big thing that I want to talk about. Well, okay, I want to just do the small thing right off the bat because I didn't see too many people saying it, and for good reason. But you know, since this is our discussion and I'm on this podcast, I gotta say it. Uh, one, some of these projects that were labeled uh, were under code names, so we don't know what they are, and you know, it's anyone's guess what any of these words could mean because people just pick stuff out of a dictionary. Mm -hmm. But one of those ones was a project platinum. Um, and that's interesting because we also, again, the universe is just giving us so much to discuss. Platinum has recently lost like Hideki who voluntarily chose to leave the studio. And, um, what I was thinking when I saw those leaks before he was leaving was that, okay, this might be another, uh, project they're working with Platinum. Uh, it would be almost too optimistic for me to think this is scale bound coming back because they were literally begging Microsoft to help them. Oh yeah, bring that project back. But uh, you know, scale bound. I I still remember scale bound being that IP that made me turn my attention to Microsoft because I grew up as a, a Nintendo gamer for most of my life. Um, and because of that, I really didn't care what the other companies were doing. But then. Uh, Microsoft, like over the years, have become more open with Game Pass. That's what got me in. And Scalebound was one of those IPs that made me think, okay, this feels like a new IP I can really get sink my teeth into. But it didn't come out, and that's unfortunate. But yeah, I do wonder if Project Platinum was that. But if it is, now the question is, well, that's looking less likely to be a thing because Platinum might be just uh, potentially being bought out themselves by somebody. <laughs> As the huge rumor is that Hideki has left um, at this moment just because but there's probably some business decisions he's not agreeing with. The biggest one possibly being that Platinum just has not had good successes with like Babylon Fall being like a huge like waste for them. 
So they might be looking towards uh, getting bought out, which he wouldn't have wanted because he enjoys the creative freedom. So I'm thinking that's what's happening. And if that's what's happening, likely this project with Microsoft, if it was Platinum Games, is likely to fall off, which is unfortunate. But I just want to bring that up quickly. Yeah, so Hideki is this <coughs> interesting gentleman. <laughs> um I, I do respect his like desire for creative freedom for all of his workers and everything, but um, it, it, looking at his Twitter feed is the most cursed thing on the planet. <laughs> like, don't interact with me in English, yada yada yada. Um, like I, I get it, I I, I kind of get it, I should say. I don't really get it, but like I respect his his business sense. Um, but. I, I I too loved the the look and style and feel of Scalebound. That was one of the first podcasts uh, we did way way back when the channel first started. It was talking about E3 uh, when it was revealed, and I I was in love with this idea of like being able to fight giant dragons, a la like Game of Thrones kind of, because uh, that was what was going on when it was announced initially. Um, so that was kind of you know, a perfect time to capitalize on a project like that. And then unfortunately it just really fell through, but it looks super interesting. So I do really hope that they're trying to bring that back as well, because just this, it felt like a, a mix between like, um, infamous style combat, a bit of devil may cry and giant freaking dragons. So it was just this really cool mix of ideas that really looked like it was going to work well together. If it was going to work well together is a whole other different thing. That might be why it got canned. Like they couldn't get it to feel right. They couldn't get the, the combat tight enough. They couldn't get the set pieces the way they want. There's a lot of reasons why a project can fall through. And I realize a lot of gamers don't understand like why projects get scrapped. But they get scrapped for a reason usually. They're not just like... Uh, we're just not vibing with this idea anymore. So if I get put in the bucket, well, we might come back to it or not. Who knows? Um, but financially, Platinum has been struggling for a while. Um, and that's why things like um, this kind of got a lot of help from Microsoft. You see Bayonetta 2 and 3 get help from Nintendo and a lot of these other little projects like Astral Chain even um, on the, the Switch was a huge one for the Switch, but it wasn't really like a massive financial success by any stretch of the imagination. I'd like to see a sequel to that because that was a cool concept game-wise. Um, but yeah, that's one that, you know, I hope is the scale bound. Uh, there's another one here, another really big talking point in all of this leak stuff that I find interesting is like the the one that really fights for game preservation. Did you see the designs for the, the new... Uh, mid refresh of Xboxes and all that. Uh, yeah, the, it basically looks like a speaker. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like um, a freaking Sonos Home or an app, uh, Apple Home Kit almost. Yeah. Um, yeah, and like Microsoft, if you own Microsoft console, you're basically just buying a bunch of appliances <laughs> disguised as <laughs> like game console. The mini fridge meme that became reality. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you got to respect that. Um, but, uh, y you were saying something about game preservation. I'm, I'm not really sure what you mean. What was No there? disc drive. No disc drive. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's a fair thing to, like a lot of what you said actually transitions to some topics I want to talk about, but let's start with that because yeah, they're definitely one of the things people were a little mad about with the mid gen refreshes is, you know, uh, Phil, I think apparently said at some point that there wouldn't be. And I'm thinking to myself, why wouldn't there be? I mean, at this point, mid-gen refreshes are basically like, we're going to do a console refresh, but not completely. <laughs> because, like, the thing problem with consoles was the fact that, you know, they become outdated really quickly. Mm -hmm. And unless you're, like, you know, Nintendo, you you typically care when your hardware can has trouble running the games that want to come out for <laughs> it. Running um, a five six-year-old build of android chips right now yeah yeah come on nintendo we need a switch pro uh, yeah, we'll definitely be talking about nintendo's uh down the line but um for microsoft yeah i was expecting mid-gen but what's interesting with this mid-gen is the fact that it's really not like a better version of the consoles which surprises me because in that sense phil did keep true to his word for better or worse but the idea is that we're just releasing all digital versions with more storage 
which is more like we this is what we should have done in the beginning because the big problem with the current Xbox, well, I guess you can say a lot of problems like this, but one of them is that there wasn't as much storage and like to expand storage required a proprietary device, which costs way more money than just getting another hard drive yourself. Uh, so yeah, this is just kind of course correcting kind of thing. And this is probably the most likely to still exist, but you uh, going to the um, game preservation side. Yeah. This is more signs of like things going more and more digital, which, you know, personally I do buy like most of my stuff digitally. Uh, but it, the fact that they're really, it'll push for less reason for people to, you know, want to like keep games preserved. But I would also argue that physical games as they exist now are still not the best version of preservation uh, yeah. just because every time you buy a new game nowadays, uh, even if you buy a disc, you have to get that day one patch. And if it has multiplayer, that's just a whole bunch of content that just doesn't exist anymore. So, yeah, I mean, there, we need to, of course, have some method of preservation, but it is kind of scary to see that. You know, nobody in the industry seems to really care. If anything, they're just kind of pushing less and less of a desire for it or at least push it out of the consumer's mind. Yeah, it's it's a big proponent of like this games as a service generation we're in right now. Like, yeah, and although speaking of that, like Sega recently canceled. This was the other topic I was thinking about when you said projects being scrapped. Sega recently canceled their games as a service IP that they've been advertising just out of the blue. So I, uh, there's a sign that games as a service are hopefully becoming less and less of a thing because most of those models just don't work and they are just not financially viable. Like, I feel like it just takes too much of a risk for it to really be worth it. Oh, yeah. Like, I played Hyenas. I was in the playtest for it. It wasn't bad, but it wasn't anything different. And that's the downside to these games as a service right now is, like, they really are feeding off of that Fortnite model that even Fortnite is seeing a decline in returning player base yep. for. And I love... Because we saw Epic is, like, uh, just a couple minutes before this recording. That 16%. Epic is, uh, yeah, of their studios going... And so, yeah, Epic's not in a great place either. And I think in their mind, they realize that what their current model is, because they verbatim said it, their current model is not good enough to sustain themselves. They need to make some changes. Mm -hmm. Will it be good changes or not is a whole other discussion, but... Yeah, so, yeah, like, for me, like, I love Zero Build Fortnite. It's it's really fun, because I, I, I grew up like the Halo kid. I, I wasted way too much time getting good at Halo. And then I tried Halo Infinite, and I'm like, this doesn't feel the same. So when they dropped Zero Build, I went to Fortnite. I'm like, this this actually feels kind of like Halo's like gunplay. So I went went to that. But like, they played off of that games as a service model too. Halo Infinite with like the the constant seasonal updates and everything, and trying to capture that same lightning in a bottle. And I feel like that's a big reason why like even Halo Infinite was a failure. Um, because the whole marketing yeah, which... point for it was like we're going to continue to refresh this world hence the term infinite yep and so like further go back to our original point in the microsoft leaks a few people point out that like there's like no halo plan for the next couple of years so this really is like the halo that they were uh, yeah, essentially planning on supporting for a while to come mm-hmm but and i doubt that is changed even now but you know who knows well, I, I was looking at the Steam page for Halo Infinite. Like, it's, it's just like seasonal updates still. Like, that's really all they've done. They did release, like, a Forge Remastered, so where you can do, like, kind of gather assets. From what I understand, I haven't played it since, like, Season 1. Um, I played all of Season 0, and then Season 1's where I fell off. I'm like, there's no new content for this, so I really... It's the same four maps. I, I'm tired of playing on the same four maps, guys. <laughs> I, I will at least give Microsoft this. I think for them, uh, with their Game Pass model, Games as a Service has at least the benefit of, okay, we're going to release this game, which you all have just access to by paying into our subscription, uh, among many other titles, and we'll just keep supporting it. So it just becomes like another game that will just give long-term content to. Yeah. So I, I think at least for Microsoft, there's at least more viability with this model, but... In that sense, even just because they 
do have that, it's still probably not succeeding too well. Oh, yeah. I, and I, I like the idea of Game Pass, at least as some sort of games as a service and like pseudo preservation for some of these titles, because we saw in that like before they were um, allowing a uh, Fallout 76 to go to PlayStation. Now they were thinking of just shutting it down as well, but um, the ability for them to still like ship it out to other, you know, platforms is kind of save some of these titles. I, w I won't say I'm the biggest fan of Fallout 76, but like the, the willingness for Microsoft um, to allow some of these titles to kind of teeter on out to other you know platforms and services is allowing some of these to live on. Um, but with like the downside to like like you were saying like even now like a physical disc is essentially just like you got to get the day one patch if multiplayer comes out with it you know and it shuts down like you have half of a DLC. game. <laughs> Yeah, so like Avengers, the the like Diet Destiny Avengers, it shuts down or it gets delisted in two days. Um, I actually, oh. <laughs> I I actually bought it for like five dollars on Steam. I'm like, I I played like the the first mission of it free. Um, when it first came out, I'm like, okay, this is a cool idea, but it doesn't really feel good. And then there was the whole <laughs> issue early on we're like your whole fucking ip address is just displayed on the screen so if you're streaming get well everybody knows your exact location <laughs> yeah a game that just docks you yeah that's ah, fun yeah so. but yeah avengers like i really thought that like with a big title like avengers because like i mean marvel's still like in a good place but it was in even better place back then mm -hmm. and the fact that that kind of ip uh, handled by a major studio that released like a game that was at least you know functional uh, I would have figured that if that didn't succeed most people would have just been like let's not go down this rabbit hole nope turns out I was wrong about that <laughs> exactly but, but uh, it's like how many times do we have to teach you this lesson <laughs> it's honestly it's that meme exactly but like I, I'm I'm really hoping that we're not losing the the fuck the whole like big picture here of like these games do need to carry on to the next you know generation because these are essentially a work of art. That's the the biggest part I'm at is like a lot of time, a lot of effort, and a lot of passion does go into these projects. I would like to see them preserved. Uh, to the same extent that like art is and there are foundations out there that actually do that the video game museum is a big one um you, you see people like the completionists you know fighting really deeply for the uh preservation of games media um there's a I believe it's Pink Gorilla, the the big game sh store that kept getting broken into a few years ago during COVID. Um, there are big donations to uh, media preservation in that regard. I hope we see a, a bigger drive towards something like that. But as we go further and further, this does line up with Microsoft's model of like all cloud based, all digital based. And I get it from their perspective as like whether they're a gaming company to their biggest seller is just basic it stuff they they do function as a computer company as well as you know a gaming company so if they can get everything on their infrastructure and their network architecture they are going to do that and make it as streamlined a process to create a console as possible too um azure is what the new call of duty servers run on uh which is their server base and essentially like why a lot of the older CODs went into disrepair for a while is they were moving everything over to that, um, which was an interesting process. I still think the new Call of Duties are trash um, mostly, but it is nice to see at least the Xbox versions of them are functional again. And we do see uh, even recently another one that really got me. I don't know if you saw this is Titanfall 2 is now playable again. So that was cool to see because um, it was in like complete disrepair for a while, like unplayable disrepair. And then 
randomly like last week it was like hey we got a massive update and you can play the game again and also here's a potential tease for uh titanfall 3 uh, that might be a little bit of copium for me but yeah yeah well um yeah i don't play as many multiplayer games as you so i was not aware of that but i mean i have heard about the cod thing and i guess i'm glad that there are at least steps towards that because it is surprising how like some people like for at least the good games will like stick around for like old multiplayer games um because like i know that their one game series that like a pretty niche one that i'm a fan of is like fantasy life and i know that um surprisingly a lot of people for the longest time like even years after that game which was on the 3ds was gone i figured it's like okay well no one's probably using the multiplayer function anymore but it's fun because it's predominantly single player but then i eventually found out there's like a discord community of people that were just like kind of keeping things alive for a while and i'm like oh that's pretty cool so yeah if you you know for games that have like the heart and soul for it people will come back and play and basically i mean like games that aren't just like the annual sports game where people just migrate to the next one right afterwards they'll sink seven hundred dollars into you know freaking credit for 2k but they won't ever move on to another game and then they will sit on twitter and bitch that all games are trash yeah god i remember seeing that it's hilarious um but anyway there was one last uh, point since you did bring up cloud uh, that we should go over with the leak which is the next generation was also uh, in these leaks that we saw which I mean the next generation being 2028 that's kind of predictable I remember seeing a lot of people saying and I actually do kind of agree even as someone who doesn't really own any of the current gen consoles um, that this generation despite being three years in really doesn't feel like it's gotten started and yeah. part of that, of course, was due to the craziness that was 2020, the year it released, and then getting launch games onto the system. But it's like three years in, and we still kind of feel like, uh, okay, I guess this is a new generation technically, but it just doesn't feel like it. But 2028 makes sense for them to target for like the next one, especially when they uh, set things up in 2020. <laughs> Uh, and the other thing is the fact that their plan, which this is looking more and more likely for to still be the case, is that they're planning on doing a hybrid cloud streaming device, which it kind of makes sense with how much more they're doing like X cloud and um, increasing their cloud infrastructure. And, you know, the discussion point that I kind of wanted us to talk about isn't like, is this likely? Because I feel like it is, but more like how will the competition respond now that they kind of know this is what's happening. Cause like Microsoft um, in the Activision acquisition has kind of like granted like specifically call of duty, I believe um, to like other cloud services as well. And they additionally to that, I think to help the FTC or not the FTC um, CMA, uh, CMA. Yeah, there's too many acronyms. There really but yeah, is. the CMA, uh, they were worried mostly about the cloud rights more than <laughs> buying Activision Blizzard. Just like, okay, well, how will people have the rights to this cloud service when that inevitably happens? And so Microsoft was like, cool, we'll let Ubisoft handle it. I don't know how that's like a solution that fixes everything, but it seems to have worked. So cool. But I mean, this basically says that everyone in the industry is like saying cloud is like the next thing, like undoubtedly, and we need to figure out cloud services now. So I'm wondering, like, okay, Microsoft, we know is for sure doing this. And it was PlayStation and Nintendo potentially going to respond. I mean, Nintendo, like their new system is more likely sooner than later mm -hmm. at this point but will they incorporate a cloud function? And I think there's at least a slight possibility of it just because the um, recently Nintendo has had ports, which weren't really ports. They were just cloud streams of ports of the game onto their system because their system is basically just a tablet, as we said, with like extremely outdated hardware that can't run things. Um, and additionally to that, their new model with the Switch was you know, take the, your system anywhere. It's console gaming basically at a level where you can just kind of slip it 
into wherever you go in your daily life and on the TV. And if the next switch to or whatever you want to call it is following the same thing, which it might just because of the success of the switch and for the sake of um, backwards compatibility, then they might just incorporate the uh, cloud function into said system uh, just to help people, you know, play more games than what their hardware will allow them to otherwise. And of course, the argument against it is Nintendo just like never does what other people do. Exactly. That's where I'm at. I'm, I'm torn because we see that they have like cloud versions of games, right? Because they have like Kingdom Hearts. They have, uh, they had Hitman. They had. Um, did they do Control or am I just making that up? I believe they did have a port of Control. Let me actually check that really quick. Okay. Yeah. So while Vex is checking that. Yeah. So, I mean, Nintendo has invested more into cloud than even I was thinking they would, because it makes sense for Microsoft and Sony to some extent as well with PlayStation now, but like Nintendo, they've never been like that big on online, even with their NSO service. It's just kind of been like supplementary to like their main, uh, practices of just like releasing games on their system and without even that many multiplayer games outside of like Splatoon being one of the bigger ones but they have done it more and more so the possibility exists especially if they want to if they want to try to stay in the competition to an extent then they would need to run bigger games and either that means better hardware which from a uh, portable device might be hard, so cloud is a solution to that. Not sure if it's a good solution, but it's a solution. Yeah, well, it'd be a better solution everywhere but America. Uh, yeah, uh, so, I get that's a better way to put it. <laughs> so, like, our, our network infrastructure here sucks compared to even third world countries, which is shocking to yeah, say. Yeah, and that's not even a secret. Like, our the current administration, I think, it put in something to be like, we need to get better internet over the next few years. That's, like, a thing we got to do. Yeah, we're still running off a bell copper wire, my guy. So, <laughs> it's not good. Uh, but yes, they did also have a cloud version of Control. You're not making that up. And they had Resident Evil okay. as well. Uh, and the Resident Evil port ran fairly decently. Uh, Kingdom Hearts ran like dog ass, so I don't know what's going on. Uh, yeah. Because I, I, like with X Cloud, like I've used it, and it, I mean, it really, of course, depends on your internet service. But if you have a decent internet um, and a decent, you know, a d computer then you can run it pretty well, honestly. I was able to run Dragon Quest Eleven on my freaking phone with a Ra uh, Razer Kishi controller, like, relatively well traveling around a con. So xCloud is really good for what it is. Um, mm -hmm. and, so and with Microsoft, it makes just sense to do this. But, I like, with Sony, like, to my knowledge, I feel like they still... Uh, rely on Microsoft Azure to some extent for their own stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know if this is going to be, if that's what they're going to do too, or if they're going to try to get their own cloud infrastructure going, or if they're just going in a completely different direction. Yeah, uh, and it's it's interesting you bring that up, because like Sony announced that pseudo handheld thing not too long oh, ago. Oh yeah, I forgot what it was called, but yeah, you're right. Yeah, but that is like streaming your your PS5, yeah. Um which, you know, we had with the Vita, you could stream your game to the Vita and take it to the toilet with you. I played Destiny raids on the toilet with it. So like it works. Uh the technology at least. I don't know if it's running off the same technology or improved version of that technology, so it could theoretically be a thing that works well. And it could be testing the grounds for that, you know, is there a market for our fan base of this to push it forward? It could be like that middle testing ground for them. Um, but I do, I do worry about one other thing that's been a prevalent part in all of this. And it's in the, in the leaks here from Microsoft and Nintendo's also hiring for a position for it. And it's, um, AI and machine learning enablement, um, and all of their tech or all of their gaming is moving forward. Um, so 
optimization and acceleration of game performance operations and development for create, uh, players and creators is uh, the bullet point for this. I'm guessing this was a presentation that went to like investors um, that got leaked. But that's the wording they used in this for Microsoft. And the thing that comes to my mind, do you remember the controversy a few years ago where like 2K had ads in their uh, basketball games? I did not know, but that's kind of crazy. The full price came with ads. And- they had like product placements in there. They had like advertisements. They have freaking commercial breaks basically built into the game. It was wild. Were, um, were they like, okay, I mean, I will admit there's a weird level of creativity there. Um, and if they're sponsored the game, I guess that would make sense. But you still can't justify it because those games make way too much money. It's just like in general. Exactly. <laughs> That's why there was the, the blowback from it. And I'm glad that players were like, what the fuck? I'm paying $60, $70 for this and I'm getting a fucking commercial break here. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Uh, so that's yeah. where my that's where my mind went to immediately when I saw this. I'm like, please, for the love of God, don't start baking ads fed by freaking AI into my games. Come on. Oh God, you really went to like the worst place with that. Because <laughs> when I saw that um, in the leaks, like my thought is AI has just been a part of our technology for maybe longer than most people have realized. Because mm-hmm. I swear, like when my dad starts talking about AI, um, and he has been like, uh, just because he is an engineer, but. And he's an older uh, man who's not necessarily the best with technology. So when he starts bringing up AI, you know that it's like, okay, this is just a thing people are just learning about. Got it. But AI has just been a part of, you know, what people have been using for a good bit. And I think there is a way for it to be used in games, like as was suggested in the presentation, just to like make the games run better, and especially if we're dealing with uh, cloud gaming, maybe it will help optimize the experience because th- Microsoft can't do anything about the American infrastructure. Exactly. Um, well, I mean, I guess they can. They can just pay politicians. But, you know, outside of that, they can't really do anything else. about. They're the already in enough trouble. I don't think they want to make political bribes a new thing, too. <laughs> I don't know if it necessarily is a new thing, but let's not get into conspiracy <laughs> theories. Uh, because they... um. So to find solutions of what they can do on their end to make cloud gaming and just online gaming better, I think makes sense. But I think what we're all worried about is what we're seeing with AI, like taking uh, jobs away from uh, writers, actors, artists. And, you know, that's a really big concern. That's why we had all these strikes going on. The writer Mm -hmm. strike just recently concluded um, itself. And now video games are (laughs) getting strikes and for good reason. Especially because, like, an uh, example I want to bring up, um, Digimon, which is, like, another IP I'm a huge fan of, they have, like, a web novel that's been going on. Um, and I kind of like it because, like, I feel like Digimon realizes that with their anime, it's mostly for kids, so they can't go, you know, too serious or dark with it because it's children are their target demographic. But with their side content, with, like, things like Survive and uh, Now This, they can do much darker topics. Exactly. They, but... The problem is that, uh, and part of the reason I haven't been keeping up with it, even though I, I, I might get into it pretty soon anyway, is just because the official translations, which are kind of simultaneously given to us in English, are machine translated. Like they, And because of that, they do come off very awkward. Of course they do. But also, it's just like, why couldn't you just pay somebody to just translate this for you? Like every other industry does. And, you know, the idea is, of course, because it's cheaper, the technology's there, and I don't know what, and I swear, like, some manga I'm reading, like, there's been some controversy going on with, like, the translations and the release dates, and I'm starting to wonder, either we got a new translator, and they're just kind of, like, making some mistakes here and there or worst case scenario some ai got involved and I'm yeah really we just ran it through chat gpt translate this for me here you go because like you when the translators uses different phrases from what they used to use it's like okay this is either a new guy the old guy just got no sleep or there's some ai that's taking the translations too literally and not keeping with what the common vernacular is so it's, yeah I felt like that was a little bit of the issue with some of the early translations too for um, a couple of series. Uh, 
before they went into like the uh k manga like ranger rejects like some of them were just like rougher than others so i'm like um it's like machine learning or is this you know just somebody at 5 a.m like i gotta get this translation out and i, I don't feel like <laughs> i don't feel like doing, dealing with this today so here we go yeah, I mean, Ranger Reject is, I think, the weirdest one on K Manga. This is not one of our manga discussions, but I'll just say this quick. It's weird that Ranger Reject's like one of their like really big series they just don't have up to date. While like so many of my like smaller niche series that again I think I've said in our manga stream, uh, there's like twelve people reading this, including me. So, right. uh, thank you for keeping this up to date. I will pay you for that, even if I don't like your service, just because how much I like this series and the author's work. <laughs> um be, yeah but uh let's get off of manga and back to games yeah um so yeah i think with the ai stuff i'm personally maybe this is just the naive part of me talking just because i do enjoy like technology and i do like the potential uses for ai i think it can be used responsibly especially with like the workers striking to make sure that these companies don't use it to like take advantage of things because, I mean, yes, AI can and will be uh, misused if we don't keep companies um, adhering to good practices. Like, even in my own field, like, I just think to myself, there's no way someone could do it. But I feel like there is got to be some way where technology can, like, mess up healthcare to the mm -hmm. point where it's like, okay, now we need to, like, I mean, I don't know. Go nurses do sometimes go on strike, but it's always it guilt tripped because you know people need to be taken care of but yeah it's a oh, lot yeah. harder to go on strike in healthcare i'll just say so we need to figure out something before like that happens exactly like even in like my field and in my you know side hobbies i i find it this really duality of like this is hilariously meme -y and you know oh my god please stop you know we, I'm sure you saw like the Plan Z, uh, Plankton song, floating around the uh, internet. Yeah. So yeah. I I'm like, okay, this is freaking hilarious. It's unethical as hell because it's probably using like hundreds of thousands of hours of stolen voice lines from Plankton's voice actor. But my God, it's hilarious. <laughs> but. You know, from like the. But I also think of it's like free content. Like I feel like people have makes like internet content using quote unquote stolen content for years now. That's just common practice. It's like once things get monetized, that you gotta like worry. Like when like when people want to make mods to games. Like again, I'm just trying to tie everything back to games. Yeah. If people make mods to games, then it's like, oh, that's cool. It's free. It's fun. And it doesn't hurt if anything helps the game's longevity and um, increase in customer support. But once people start charging for it, even if it is a service, you're kind of in that weird ethical gray zone. That's where Bethesda you got are... into like a lot of hot water is because they were monetizing the the Creation Club mods, which used a lot of them were just ports from over from Nexus and you know a lot of these other services that you could just get it for free. Um, yeah, and that wasn't, you know, I mean, if the creators were getting compensated, there's at least some justification there. But at the same time, I, in general, monetizing off of fan works or mods is just like a gray zone you just kind of don't want to be involved with. Yeah. But, uh, it, it, I think we've more or less, oh, go ahead. I, I feel like that was the big uh, wake up call for Bethesda too, because they started relegating a lot more like communication between the modding community and their own team and a lot of people that worked on bigger mods like um there's uh sky oblivion are uh working with them now uh, a couple of people that worked on the remaster of uh, right, I don't even want to call it a fucking remaster because it's just an updated graphics version. But like the special edition of Skyrim, a couple of people that worked on that came from the modding community as well. So uh, even in all the controversy that came out of that, there was some good that came out of it, you know. And I hope that now that we're potentially getting remasters of Oblivion and a couple of these other games, uh, older games for them. It's weird to think that 
Oblivion's like 15 years old, 16 years old, um, <laughs> because it just ages me. But like some of these older games getting remastered, I'm hoping some of the modding community also got brought onto that because they understand that game better than some of the people that are working on their current stuff because they spent years working on mods for that. And I don't think a lot of people recognize the devotion uh, for something like that. Um, but yeah, go ahead. Uh, yep, yeah, I was going to say, I think we've um, pretty exhaustively discussed the leaks, unless there was like any other points uh, you want to bring up. Um, uh, because like, I can't really speculate on like what these other projects are. No, or, like, there's no way to speculate are. on a lot of these projects at the moment. Um, which is unfortunate and fortunate at the same time, because I do, I do think we live in an era where we're fed too much, um, because of leaks. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we got to the point where official announcements are just like underwhelming, like right. the last state of play. And like, I remember that day when it's like, man, we got a Nintendo direct, the state of play and like NASA all making like big announcements all on the same day. And it's like, okay, well, weirdly enough, NASA might have been the most interesting thing to think about right. that day. <laughs> Which, I mean, is good, but also not great. Uh, but at the same time, it's like for Nintendo, it's like, and maybe we can transition with that to our next discussion with Nintendo if we want. Uh, with Nintendo, it might be because they're going on to next gen or with um, PlayStation. I don't know what they're doing at all and it's weird because i guess another topic we could potentially transition to is jim ryan of course is retiring and i doubt he just woke up today and like decided to announce that so that could have been in the works for a while so maybe some big things are happening at sony as well yeah so jim ryan rotten piss um <laughs> i i think i I have this really jaded uh perspective of him because i've dealt with his shenanigans as a gamer for so long as a Sony fan and I'm just, I was just sick of it by the end of it. But at the same time, I, I do, I do think he did some good because a lot of change did happen under his, um, under his watch. We did see like a massive uptick in sales. We did see there, there actually start to be, you know, because PS, PS3 and PS4 were kind of like this weird ground until, you know, the Jim Ryan era. We saw Sony get better once he started to take the reins, but he was very much anti-consumer. And that's the the very, very obvious part from this whole battle back and forth between Microsoft and Sony. Uh, was thinking that it was like anti-consumer, the acquisition of, you know, Activision, right? But I think... A lot of it came to uh, head during those proceedings like, okay, it's time for me to step out because I must just be out of touch with the industry and I'm getting dunked on online to a level that is like Elon Musk levels of dunking. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, a lot of his own statement on the matter was like, I'm getting old, it's hard to go between Europe and North America, which, you know, valid for a man in his 50s. But at the same time, like the timing of it is what's very interesting <laughs> because PlayStation has been doing great. So uh -huh. it's not like we're getting rid of you because you're not doing good for the PlayStation side. Because uh, I was talking with Vex about this yesterday, but like part of the reason he's likely been in this position for as long as he has been is just because while Sony, Sony hasn't been doing great business wise in recent years. But PlayStation is undoubtedly like their strongest branch or at least one of the strongest branches they have because their computer wise and other tech wise, they've just not been on the ball. So, yes, I understand like why they had Jim around for that. So the fact that he's kind of uh, quietly <laughs> going away from his position now makes it seem like, OK, maybe his position just went into jeopardy after like all these legal proceedings we were just talking about earlier have just been kind of going in Microsoft's favor, putting them in like a worse position. And then it's like, well, someone has to take the fall for not. And, and, and you have been the internet's punching bag for the last couple months. So you are the one taking the fall. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, you know what? 
I, at least he's retiring like at a place where he can at least say he's done a good job with like most of his career. Mm -hmm. But what I find funny, and I'm speaking as someone who, who has never like owned a PlayStation console, like my brother had a PSP and I played it sometimes. That's the most PlayStation I've done. Um, but I, and when I saw this announcement, I figured I would see like a good mix of some people saying, it's like, I wonder who the next person will be or like, what's the business practice? Or it's like, okay, well, I, you've done a good here and hopefully the other person will follow, but no, like there was so much just absolute cheering. And I have to say from an outsider's perspective, it was shocking just because like for all intents and purposes, PlayStation has been doing well business wise. They've been getting good I exclusives and IPs. And I've not agreed with a lot of their decisions uh, in terms of like how they're pricing things and the fact that they're like, while well, other there are competitions out here doing things like Game Pass. They're like, nah, we're not going to do that. We're just going to release an inferior streaming service. <laughs> and then just like, and for all the dunking, um, we didn't really talk about the emails uh, that got leaked in the Microsoft leaks. But I remember one of the leaks, they said, it's like Sony paid too much attention to like all their audio stuff. And honestly, I kind of agree. I remember that being a big thing when they announced the PS5. And I'm like, why? Do like, I know there's a section of people who care. But this is too much care. And I get you're an audio company, but like what? Like you could have put more focus in things like backwards compatibility or something oh, yeah. or preservation than audio. Yeah, I don't know. It was just weird to me that they did all that. So I don't know why people were clowning on that particular email. And I mean, the, the Nintendo email, I understand. Like that was ridiculous. <laughs> God, the Nintendo email. <laughs> <laughs> Which I mean, like again, that was just hypothetical. They're not actually like making serious plans right. by Nintendo, but the fact that even like you know, just hypothetical, like oh man, Nintendo would totally be lucky to work with us. Yeah, I don't know about that one, Chief. <laughs> like I think of that the same way when I think of when people said it's like oh Nintendo should like buy out Sega or something, and I'm like no, what? Like okay, Nintendo, the Sega for all their faults, like they've still been releasing some pretty quality games, and they do more with their overall IP than Nintendo. Right. Who's out like oh, everybody wants a new F Zero? Uh, okay, how about we a, just release a this racing random battle royale game? Yeah, and a new DK. So people want new DK. How about a remake of Mario versus DK? And meanwhile, Sega's out here like, and I mean, I don't know if we, I would probably want to dedicate more time to talk about this because this was on my brain today. Is Sonic Frontiers, they're just all this DLC we've been getting for free has just been, hey, uh, here are all the things we want fixed in the game. And Sega's like, cool, let's just do that. Mm -hmm. And that's what's been done. Like, Let's, it's crazy. And let's also just have a random gaggle of strippers at the Tokyo Game Show. Yeah, I mean, I think that's more like in line with the Yakuza franchise. Um, and it's like weird. It's just kind of on brand for them to be like pretty sex positive, honestly, because Front Forces, the last Sonic game, had Hooters as one of their big uh, sponsors. I, I just it saw was, that you you had either liked or retweeted that. I'm like, what the fuck is going on here? I just logged into Twitter today and I am confused and mildly horny now. What the hell? <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I got to respect Sega for at least doing that. Because we like to say a bunch of stuff about like uh, pole dancers, but like the lady was just entertaining an audience. Like nobody right. was actually getting any sexual services. Right. People... Like, it's really just like, hey, we have attractive women. We People like attractive women. And right. it's like, we're just going to have them here. It's like, you won't see Nintendo doing that. No, it was just a call. It, what it reminded me of is like, E3 used to have booth babes. And that's what it just reminded me of. I'm like, are we back in this era? I'm okay with this because the world is a lot more sex positive now. And is it as just like, oh, they're objectifying them. You know, so I was. I was yeah, I mean, I saw a whole, oh, man, I'm trying to remember which video it was. But there was like a video that came up on my recommended feed. I think it was like some kind of some brothers, but whatever. They were talking about the history of video game award shows and like with Spike TV and like the stuff they had back in the day as like the prototype for like uh, the game awards. And it was just so levels of creepy that I'm like, wait, I remember watching some of this as a kid. Did I just 
not understand any of this? I guess not, because I was a child. But yeah. Wow. I remember they used to give out, like, Golden Stag Awards back on, like, Spike TV. I'm like, what the fuck? Looking back on it, it was just really weird. But um, yeah, it was just extremely misogynistic to a level that's like, this is just blatant. Yeah. And uh, you you just ran with it back then because that was the entertainment industry. Like early, yeah, I mean, early G4 even like I, I know they have regrets on some of the stuff that they did. You know, and that's what's, you know, really cool that they do. You know, they, they are self-aware of how bad some of the stuff was. Uh, I mean, that's at least good to hear. I mean, and I'm for all the faults that Game Awards have, I'm glad at least gotten to a point where video games are a more respectable medium. But we can also have some sex-positive stuff on this side, right. too. And but, uh, I, there's one other one you brought to my attention that was really blatantly stupid wording, I think. And that is Capcom thinking that games don't cost too much. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's another good one to talk about. So, yeah, I didn't read the full article, I will admit, on this, but I also didn't really want to because I had other stuff to do. But Capcom basically was like, games are costing more. People, We have to pay people more money because, oh, boo-hoo. Um, and so maybe we need to get more money by charging people more games. And people in the comments and replies like, okay, we're talking about the same company that's like out here releasing microtransactions and like their full price games and whatnot. Because it's like, I understand game development is getting more expensive, but I don't think charging an arm and a leg is the solution. I'm pretty sure we will be getting into like the end of whatever, or even the mid part of whatever the next generation is. Uh, closer to even $80 with games because we're already getting used to like 70. So it's like, well, it's only a matter of time. But at the same time, I think a better solution than charging more games is basically do the opposite of what Square Enix's current uh, strategy is, which is release more smaller titles, not just all like these triple A titles that will require uh, so much money. And I think one of the reasons I guess that people are excited that Jim Ryan's leaving is because he particularly wanted a big push to these giant cinematic games, which I think have become very synonymous with AAA and what a new game should slash is supposed to be. And I think because of that, it kind of like really colored our perceptions on like what is like a real game, which is kind of a weird and disgusting thing to say. Because like with um, in, next month, we have like, Mario and Sonic both releasing new 2D platformers and they will be releasing it, you know, full price because they are full priced new games that had years put into them. And, you know, I don't know if I will buy them day one uh, myself. I usually do with Sonic, but I'm just going to wait and see because I'm a bigger 3D fan than 2D fan. That's neither here nor there. But with this game, I'm thinking that it's like weird that people are this upset about what $60 games is considering what they're willing to pay $70 and $80 games for. Like at least this look those games look like extremely quality releases that are finished products that won't need a bunch of updates and patches. Like probably still some because I'm not that naive. But it, comparatively those big AAA projects, they're gonna come out like broken, unfinished, and it'll be like a year in before people are like, hey, Cyberpunk is actually really good now. <laughs> oh, God, you had to go there. Me who just bought the DLC for Cyberpunk. <laughs> I mean, it's just so funny to me. Because, again, like, I still have to watch the Netflix series. I don't know why I didn't watch it. I just saw some of the first episode. I'm like, cool, I'm going to finish this at some point. But, like, after that, like, I thought a lot of the positivity for Cyberpunk was specifically for that animation. Which, you know, fair enough, it looked really good. But no, people were actually just like hyping up the game. And, you know, it's one thing when No Man's Sky for, like comes out like with some problems, but then gradually like gets better because that's a small studio. They overhype themselves. And I think part of that was on the marketing team. In fact, another video by those same people who did the history of video games also did something about like marketing practices. Um, and like with the way we hype up marketing, um, and they use cyberpunk as their example, they like overhyped it so much that the developers just couldn't live up to expectations at the time. Uh, and that's a whole problem for not just us, but mostly the people who are selling us on these games. Oh, uh, absolutely. So yeah, I, 
so yeah, I think my ultimate point is that uh, with Capcom, if they want to like deal with the cost of games, just give us smaller scale games. Like we'll pay a good amount of money and it doesn't have to be $70, $80. It could just be 60 or 50 or even less, depending on like what it is. And people will pay it if people are willing to pay like a 80 bucks plus DLC down the line. Uh, Cause like even tales of arise, like two years later, they're releasing like a full price DLC. And I'm like, you know what? I might buy this like not immediately, but at some point. I'm just seeing how much the new EA football game is just to, to f- go off here. Point of comparison. Yeah. Yeah. That's a fair. Cause everybody uh, will buy that. And that is a fan oh, of yeah. those stupid games. Uh, pre-order now. People will buy consoles for that. I see, you know, I don't know. I don't think I ever told you this story, but it still sticks out in my mind. When I first went to college, um, the college I went to was like a big school where a lot of the people from high school are also there. So I kind of saw them around, even the ones I was only casually acquaintances with. And like one of the first times somebody knocked on my door, I mean, I had a roommate. So I first thought, oh, it was just my roommate coming back. It was actually just like a, a dude from my school with some of like his other f- new friends he's been making. And I'm like, oh, hey, man, uh, what are you doing here? He's like, oh, hey, uh, do you have FIFA? And I'm like, what? It's like, oh, yeah, hey, do you have FIFA? We want to play FIFA. So we're looking for someone with FIFA. And I'm like, okay, I don't think we don't, we barely talked in school. Like, I know who you are, but I don't believe in any of our discussions I've mentioned. Oh, man, I love FIFA. I have the latest FIFA. Why did you just come to my room for <laughs> I didn't say that out loud. I just told him, no, I don't. He just went to someone else. But I'm just thinking, okay, is FIFA that big? (laughs) And yeah, the answer is yes. So it's a $70 game for the standard edition and $100 for the ultimate edition. Yep. And that's just the thing. Like even like 70 and what will probably be 80 soon is not even like the full game experience. There's like whole season passes that we're now used to. So I don't know why people would be mad about paying $60 for like a 2D platformer in today's age or even less money for like a smaller project that people can release. Cause some of those games are like the best games you'll play and you'll pay half the amount of money you would have for like a much bigger title, which is likely to come out again, incomplete. Yep. So yeah, I think there's the better solution is just to release smaller scale games, but I don't think that's what, the industry's at and i'm hoping that changes yeah i really I, do so like i i think capcom really got a big head uh with the success of the more recent resident evils they got a big head with a lot of the uh i mean lo- oh you know, god monster hunter just went off and i'm yeah even sonic had like a whole like dlc collaboration like i remember when frontiers came out i thought man we can have some cool skins but we really didn't get that many skins, like some anniversary skin and Monster Hunter, and also like a prom- one promotional thing. Yeah. So I'm just like, why specifically Monster Hunter? Because Monster Hunter is just that big. It, it, it's shocking because I remember back in the day, like my first experience with it was like on the PSP, and I'm like, okay, this is a cool concept. I'm not the biggest fan. And then now there are like 7,000 different versions of this game. I'm like, is it really that popular? And I looked Apparently, at, I, I looked at my friend's Steam list the other day. I'm like, what can we play together? And I saw they had like a thousand plus hours in Monster Hunter World. I'm like, how? I played I that know. once I on the stream. I have the game and I still have to play it someday just to find out. Yeah, I played it once on a stream and I'm like, okay, this is cool. I'm not going to ever play this again. <laughs> I, yeah, I played like, I think three on my 3DS for like a day and I'm like, I don't get it. So I figured then when I researched it, this, there was just better Monster Hunters down the line. That That's what I'm expecting. Yeah. It's a game you either love or hate, and I, I just don't like the, the, the type of gameplay. And that's, I think, another reason why I wasn't the biggest fan of like Horizon is you're breaking off components of the monsters and using that as crafting material and yada, yada, yada. Um, cause it has some of that gameplay loop and it mixed with the, that, that Jim Ryan esque, like, um, you know, massive story expansion and over exploration of a vast universe. But again, bringing up your point, like we're getting a complete edition of that. I never bought the second one because I knew they would do this shit again. And yeah. like, it's unfortunate because People fall into the trap of just like, I'm going to buy a $70 game and then 
a year or two down the line. Here's a complete version. Yeah, I do hate that, especially when it's like, at least with Horizon, though, I expected it because I bought the complete edition of the first one because um, uh, I didn't, I just watched gameplays for the first game and I'm like, cool. And then a complete edition comes out. I'm like, great, I'll just buy this one instead. Yep. Uh, but like uh, Dragon Quest Eleven, which you mentioned earlier, like I bought that like day one because DQ is like one of my all time favorite mm-hmm. franchises. I love the Dragon Quest games. Looking forward to Twelve immensely, and um, even the the Timasano version, which is going to be like probably one of my game of the years when that comes out. But DQ Eleven, when that came out with like its definitive edition, I'm like, why? <laughs> I, like, just why? You first of all, the first game had so much content that it's like I can't be too mad that I didn't have a good experience. But what is the point of just releasing a whole other addition to this game? It's not like it wasn't successful where you need to reap benefit the cost. It's Dragon Quest. And two, it's like there was a fair amount of content that you could have put in a DLC, but not like to the point where it's like this is worth the whole other game. I, I just don't understand why they did that. And I'll be honest, that made me mad. I'm not going to say I didn't buy it later because I did get it on sale because, again, there was content in there that I thought was, like, good and worth my time to play. Mm-hmm. But, man, I'm not – that made me very upset. Definitive editions do annoy me when I get caught up in it, but that's also the big reason I just don't buy most games day one. Yeah. It, and I also, it, by the same token, the series that I do buy day one, I'm expecting them not to do that to me. <laughs> Yeah, I I feel like fighters in general are a big culprit of that too, because you have how many versions of Street Fighter and how many versions of Mortal Kombat at this point. <laughs> That's why I didn't bother yeah, buying Mortal Kombat One. Away with it somehow. <laughs> like I will, I will enjoy Mortal Kombat One when it's one playable, and two, I I can have my complete edition that you lied to me for uh, 11 and you lied to me for 10 that you wouldn't do this ed boon uh, so i know you're gonna fucking do it again <laughs> i don't actually even know what's going on with mortal kombat they have like a mortal kombat one that just released and i'm yep. like okay what is with all these gaming companies and just being like one is our new next game like uh, xbox did it they did it so uh, the long and short of it is luke kang reset the timeline so uh, it, it's okay, a, so it's wait, it's a soft reboot then. Yep, it's a soft reboot. But like, okay, is there a reason for them to do a soft reboot? Uh, because Did the story get too complicated to follow, or is it just that it was declining in sales, so they needed like a big entry to revitalize? The so picture? he beat the the big bad in eleven, who had the power over time. So story wise, he just rebooted the timeline to try and prevent all the bad things from happening. That's the the quick and dirty version of it. Um. And of course, because it's Mortal Kombat and we need to sell basically gore porn, uh, we have a timeline where uh, everything still goes to shit somehow. I cannot believe that we are still getting even gorier and gorier fatalities at this point. I thought when we were ripping spines out and, you know, one and two, that was the peak of it. No, I, I just watched one on TikTok because somehow I'm on Mortal Kombat TikTok. And I, I watched <laughs> one where there is literally a dude getting turned into mincemeat slowly and painfully. I'm like, okay, this is Saw-esque levels of gore. This doesn't need to happen. <laughs> Mm, that is something but also i'm very interested that there's multiple timelines in the mortal Kombat universe it's a Um, whole rabbit hole if you want to go down it it it, like it has rebooted more times than i care to admit (laughs) well okay i mean good for them i surprised sometimes with like the amount of story in fighter games because when it comes to fighter games i always hear about people talk about the multiplayer and which games like are the best to play against and get good at but I don't hear too much about the narrative because I always feel like it's like COD or it's like they don't put much attention to the story, even though a story exists technically. Yep. But I guess they put more thought into it than I Mortal Kombat's okay. one. Mortal Kombat and Tekken and Street Fighter, I think, have really good stories. I just suck at fighting games. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's why I've never really got into it. I've never gotten good at fighting games. 
if I sat down and put as much time into a fighting game as I used to put into like Halo, I would probably be good at it. But there are so many different combos and inputs, and then my brain just goes like, uh, what am I doing? Butt mash. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, that's just what I do, but when I do anime fighter games, yep. and I mean, those games, they just, like, reiterate the story of the anime, basically, yep. so it's pretty easy. Yep. Okay, I'm playing like, Naruto all over again for the 87th time, cool, um, whatever, yeah. you know? I mean, it sells, so they can do it. I, I, I sat down and bought Dragon Ball Kakarot just to play through it. But I also only mm -hmm. paid like three bucks for it, so I don't care. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's honestly the smart thing to do nowadays. And I think uh, that's the other thing, like with games getting more expensive, it's just realistically better to just buy the games either used or on sale and at this point. So Steam is great for that. Steam is like the best for that. And that's why I love being a PC gamer. <laughs> mm -hmm. Same, same here. Uh, it's also one of the reasons it sucks to be a Nintendo gamer because Nintendo will never cut down on any of their stuff. I got and happy. Actually, I, think, I got happy that there was a ten dollars sale on Pokemon. <laughs> yeah, I remember getting like any sale when I was on my 3ds. Any sales on like any RPG or stuff I'm just going to play because it's like this is the best I'm going to get. Yep. Uh, but I think it's a good time to transition to Nintendo because. Mm -hmm. Um, they are, of course, rumored to be having like their new console coming out, possibly even as soon as next year. Uh, others have said maybe the year after, but it's, basically it's in the imminent future. Um, I've seen pretty good arguments for both, but I think either way we know it's coming. But the big question is, what is there? And time back to the very first topic that we had with the Microsoft leaks, one of the leaks talked about um, a meeting with uh, Activision Blizzard like that Nintendo had where they were like, hey, you guys didn't really support the Switch, uh, which makes sense because it's a freaking tablet. <laughs> uh, so how about our next console be more comparative in power to uh, last generation? And I remember thinking to myself, huh, okay, well, that's good in terms of the fact that even our current gen uh, has a lot of crossover with last gen, which... Mm -hmm. Probably is part of the reason that this generation really hasn't taken off, to be honest. But another thing is just the fact that Nintendo could probably be able to handle more third-party games easily, even if it is going to be uh, outdated pretty quickly. The other thing is, like, do they really just do that in a portable format, or is the next uh, Nintendo's console going to be something completely different? I've seen pretty good arguments for both, but uh, what are your thoughts on this? I, I don't know, and th that's the thing, is Nintendo is so freaking unpredictable in what they do, because we went from a era of cartridges to these little tiny CDs to, you know, big CDs again, back to cartridges that had bitterant in it because they were so small and they didn't want kids to swallow them, so <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't know how to predict anything nintendo does um i i figure well because we've seen the performance failures of mortal Kombat on um just to tie it into that on the switch because they had mortal Kombat one on there i don't know if you saw any of the videos of like how bad it looks but i've it, heard the reports but yeah so like if it can't even support something like a, a 2d ish flat fighter anymore we desperately need that console refresh or that next generation. I I would see it being on par with like the, the Xbox One and the PS4 though. Um, performance wise, I don't know what it will look like. Is the biggest thing. I don't know what kind of yeah, media I definitely, will support. You know? I definitely don't think it'll be comparable to current gen consoles. I would have hoped, like if I had to hope, that it would at least be closer to maybe the mid gen. Of last generation, but that might be asking for too much from Nintendo. Exactly. Honestly. That that was Which, where my brain yeah, was. That's so sad. Because they, they they like their their niche little market, and their niche little market just happens to be the biggest market right now. Like the Switch is still like the most home installs. Um, which is wild to think about, but it also really isn't because it's been out the longest of this generation of consoles. Um Yeah. And that's and mostly also, due in addition to, the, to that, I mean 
Apple like recently was like pushing more and more the idea of playing consoles stuff on your phone. And I mean, as silly as that sounds, the phones are capable of it. Mm -hmm. If they can get the games, then theoretically it's plausible. So, I mean, if Apple really makes a serious push and I mean, we've said this about many other companies, Google tried it with Stadia, it did not work out. Amazon has Luna, which is, I don't know what they're doing there. It's not like a bad service, but it's just like they're barely utilizing it. Uh, but so if Apple actually is trying, then they could maybe make something that uh, has the whole portable game system uh, even more like less in Nintendo's favor. And if, of course, everyone else is going to switch to cloud gaming uh, to get more portability out of their systems while Steam is uh, iterating on the Steam Deck, Nintendo won't have their freedom to just do whatever they want in the space forever. That's how they messed up after the Wii. They just realized that the casual gamer has other gaming options. Yeah, so I embarrassingly I had a I had completely forgot that I had subscribed to Luna. So I had to go in and cancel that recently because I <laughs> Oh my god. I'm glad I helped you save some money. God, subscription services are like evil in terms of like you just forget they exist. I it just like uh, here's the here's how I forgot about it is it just bills as an Amazon purchase. I'm like, oh, it might just be one of my comics now because you know it's a five ninety nine payment. And so I'm like, oh right, I have like five comics coming out this week. So it, and they all bill as Amazon now. I'm like, oh shit, it must have just been one of my comics drops. I'm like, oh, there's nothing there. Maybe it's one of my Prime channels that I have. And then I go through and I'm like, you have subscribed to Amazon Luna for 36 months. I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> so this, uh, it's been billing me for like three years and I just completely forgot about it. Oh <laughs> uh, man. Wait, so did you just cancel it while while we were streaming? Uh, no, 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 no. I canceled it last week. When I, oh, okay. Because uh, that would that's funny. If I just reminded you, that's what I was thinking. Uh, but uh, like I just they updated their website to where it shows like what you've subscribed to the most, and it was just there. I'm like, oh fuck. Cause I got the controller for my controller wall, because I, I have a, a whole wall of controllers. And if you subscribe to it early on, you just got the controller. You get a controller, yeah, yeah. I remember that. It looks like a good controller, honestly. It is. It's, it's, it's just... comparable to the Stadia controller, which is one I absolutely loved. And I still use this like my primary PC controller when it supported. I still find it so weird that like these companies, these major companies that actually design some competent hardware and decent streaming uh, software just like, we're not able to like break out into this cloud platform before it like really takes off. Right. And, and I mean, cause you think they would. The funny thing is like Amazon's web service powers 90% of the internet at this point, but they can't make a competent streaming service. <laughs> I don't even understand it. It's like so strange. It makes no sense. But at the same time, it's like, you know, it's good thing Amazon doesn't rule over us all yet. <laughs> it's uh, getting there. They're they're launching their own internet service too. Oh god, oh, god. god, that just sounds. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, there goes all the privacy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just that once. Yeah, honestly, they know so much about me at this point from having worked there, and also from like the fact that I search search amazon for most of my shopping because this is just convenient like oh i am in this random city i can have it delivered to this hotel cool i i'm okay with them having like all of my data on that capacity i don't want them knowing my browser history uh, like, yeah I, I, and I, it's worse because we know some of that data is gonna be up for sale so yeah it is honestly absolutely uh i i'm uh, streaming you know uh for their like satellite here cool they know what hentai i looked at now next thing i know my amazon front page is all hentai great <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay so uh let me see what were we talk oh yeah nintendo so yeah with nintendo i mean they always do something very weird and like untraditional and like whether it succeeds or not is like a whole thing because like with the GameCube, it's like, let's release like an extremely powerful hard drive, very even with some portability, but use like these tiny discs that are proprietary and can barely hold games. And then it just becomes like, despite having like, honestly, one of their strongest libraries, like 
uh, one of the worst selling consoles. Then we had the Wii, which sold like crazy, but on, people kind of forgot about it. Like after the early years, it just like it became a thing, more of a joke in the gaming community by the end of them. The Wii U was a whole disaster train uh, from start to finish. Then the Switch, I'll be honest, I was very unsure like how it would end up playing out because it, again, we do have some portable gaming in other formats, but it did succeed for them. So then will the next console be a success to follow up or will they come up with something brand new that will hurt them? I mean, personally, I think that the best move they have, and maybe I'm just saying this as someone who doesn't own a Switch, um, is to have another console that is uh, capable of playing Switch games in like a portable fashion. Because like the original they might well 3DS. Yeah, like the way they went from the their other portable systems, which I think have almost always been successful, like the Game Boy to the DS to the 3DS to the Switch. Mm-hmm. I mean, I guess the idea is that they always could play like the last generation, which automatically gives your new generation console like a bunch of games, especially for players like me who haven't hopped on. And even if they have, you can just have those same games like, potentially enhanced and like with higher quality, which just gives them a better experience for those games. Um, And you can, of course, sell them at like really cheap discounted prices. Uh, So I think that that would be Nintendo's best thing to kind of just reiterate off of their current thing and maybe just like add, like if the DS was like, okay, Game Boy, but with two screens and 3DS was DS, but with the 3D screen, then but the Switch just do like, okay, it's the Switch, but like, I don't know, some other software that gives better interconnectivity or multiplayer or even just cloud streaming. We have like like what Microsoft is doing, which I brought up earlier. So I, I think that's their best bet, but because it's Nintendo, they could just be like, you know what? What if we just uh, developed like an augmented reality device? And it's like... Okay, well, let's see how this plays out. Like, I I find that funny that you bring that up because it just brings me back to the fact that uh, Apple was going into the augmented reality with their goofy ass headset. Um, And I know it will sell like a billion devices because it's Apple and they have a cult. Uh, So, I mean, that's the nice thing with Apple. They can just like make whatever they want. People will buy it. And Nintendo's the same way, honestly. Like, so yeah, they- but at least Nintendo at least has like I mean, they are the Apple of the gaming industry. I won't disagree with that even at all. But they at least have like failures like the Wii U that kind of keep them somewhat humble. Yeah, it, it, like Apple has to have a- like Apple just released like the iPad, which was like the iPhone but bigger and can't make calls, and it was just became a whole line of devices. Yep, it, like. I, I think the only failure that Apple will have, other than like their home pods, will likely be this new iPhone Pro. And that's simply because it seems to be like the weakest phone that they have, you know, backlash wise. But they don't have a massive failure like Samsung did with the Note 7, right? So Samsung has to remain a little bit humble too. Apple can do whatever the fuck Apple wants. You know, and they'll they'll sell forever, which is why I I think that this like gaming foray will be successful for them as well. Because as much as I hate to admit it, their stuff is powerful enough to handle gaming. I would yeah. love to live in a fantasy world where Nintendo had the idea to release, you know, go from like a tablet to like a phone like device, and have the power of say the iPhone, and you know, just realistically have that kind of capability. I know that is never going to happen because Nintendo just wants to do Nintendo things. Um, so like with, if they were to go into like an augmented reality, I feel like it would have a massive failure rate like the virtual boy did back in the day. (laughs) I mean, yeah, I would think so too. But the weird thing is I can't think of what weird thing Nintendo will do because they came out with Labo and I'm like, what is this? My ass so, baked on 420 building Labo. 
because so they can just, I don't know, they could just make a Fisher Price toy and be like, it plays games too, because that's what the Switch was. So there's literally nothing off the table, but at the same time, that makes it harder to figure out what it could be if it's not just more Switch, which I think is the smartest as Way stupid forward. as Lava was, it was fun too. It was, it was a cool yeah. idea. <laughs> yeah, it, it was. Um, but yeah, so with Nintendo, I'm hoping that at the very least we have backwards compatibility because I was just sitting here waiting for a Switch Pro because they always have the portable systems with like in mid gen refresh right. effectively. And, and the fact that, that. And the fact that we didn't get that shows that they were already working on something else past this. And it kind of makes you oh, wonder, yeah. because we still haven't got Metroid Prime 4, which was the last, you know, release era game that hasn't came out. Because we finally got Shin Megami Tensei, but we ne- and we finally got Bayonetta 3, which was the other holdout. We never got Metroid Prime 4, which makes you wonder if it just is getting reworked now for the next generation. Yeah, I've heard that too. And it honestly makes sense because we heard at one point the development basically had to be reset. Yep. And if you had to reset a whole development, I feel like it's going to be at this point minimally a cross gen title, much like um, Breath, Breath of the Wild, Wild. was. Yep. Yeah, so uh, that's my prediction for Metroid Prime 4. And I think that's also the, the reason they keep releasing these uh, Metroid Prime remakes, just to kind of keep the IP alive active and so when they release four for the cross gen it'll be like cool if you have a switch yeah you'll be good because we've developed it for it from the beginning but also it's going to be on this next device but of course if they do that i think that's all the more reason they should at least try to keep things backwards compatible but that doesn't guarantee nothing because look at the wii u and the switch and you despite breath of the wild being on both systems there was a um, big performance but- difference between the two I think another thing I just wanted to mention real quick, because I was going to say it earlier, but I forgot, was that when we were talking about, like, you know, uh, games not able to run perfectly well on the Switch, like newer games, there was, like, a recent um, interview about the new 2D Sonic game that I was mentioning earlier, and they said, uh, it's like, yeah, this is going to run... 60 frames on all devices, including the Switch. And I just love that they specified that, yes, even the Switch is going to be running this 2D platformer at 60 frames per second. And I'm just, it's just funny because it's both because like Frontiers, the last game on the Switch was 30 because it could not handle it at 60 uh, and possibly screwed up a lot of other optimizations in other games. That's a whole other topic. But it's a 2D platformer from it should not be struggling to run 60, but I guess it's something people would be worried about. So they had to reassure consumers through this interview. Hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, oh, I did have more Sonic things I want to talk about, but uh, before I nerd out on Sonic, uh, do you have other topics you want to bring up? Cause I know you didn't want to stretch this for too much longer. I honestly have to go back to our log of stuff here really quickly. Okay, do you mind then if I just fanboy for a bit? (laughs) Go ahead. Okay, cool. So what the big thing with Sonic that I was hinting at this whole time, that Sonic Frontiers, the third DLC, which was like the big one that we've been waiting for like the whole year, is coming out tonight. And it's the first time we're going to get all of these new characters playable because most, for a while, Sonic games only really had Sonic playable and maybe Shadow just replicating Sonic's moves. And that I really do blame the older generation of video game uh, gamers just because they really hated Sonic's friends to the point where Sega was like, okay, cool, we just won't have them around anymore, which sucks for the generation, my generation, who grew up with those friends and enjoyed playing as them. So finally we're getting that back. Apparently they were last all playable in a mainline game 17 years ago. So yeah, that'll be fun. And just like the game itself, I loved all the improvements they added it to the point where, um, and this was, I think where I try to make it a discussion topic of sorts, because otherwise this would just be, be ranting about Sonic for like 15 minutes. Uh, that this game is so much different than how it was. And we've talked about how like other games like Cyberpunk and No Man's Sky, they just improved themselves over time. That I wonder if it's like worth 
uh, almost re-reviewing some games like after release and they've had time to uh, come out. Because on one hand, it's a, they shouldn't do that just because it almost sort of rewards uh, developers. Well, I shouldn't say developers. It's not usually their fault. But it, it rewards game creators for like not having complete games at release and just like working on it after they get people's money, if they do at all. But on the other hand, I think sometimes, and especially in this game's case, the game experience is like so much different with so much added features that were brought up as like uh, concerns or lacking in the initial reviews that I feel like the game they released now is uh, a step above what it was. But at the same time, I don't see it happening realistically just because this season of games is already like so super packed. I mean... You have Mario, Sonic, Spider-Man, and probably a whole host of other things that I'm not thinking of at the moment releasing like in a couple weeks because uh, October was just packed with their, uh, Gamescom. But uh, at the same time, I'm very excited to play this game. And I do wonder uh, what are your thoughts on re-reviewing games? I, I have mixed feel- feelings on that because like on one hand, like, Honestly, the games don't always release in their best state, right? And it's obvious, but at the same time, that is the version that gets submitted to reviewers, you know, as like, this is what we're doing with our game. But, like, No Man's Sky is a 1,000 times a different game than it was initially when it came out. Even I will admit that, and I was burnt the fuck by that game originally, right? Uh, cause I bought it day one because I'm like, oh, millions of planets to explore. All of them are desolate and same looking. <laughs> um, yeah. Ish, that was a rough launch. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, we have a completely different game now. So it, I feel like IGN has done a good job with this. I hate fucking using them as a uh, point of reference, but they do at least take into account, like, new DLC as, like, okay, this makes this game completely different, like, a Phantom Liberty, for example, for, um, like, uh, Cyberpunk. It makes it a, you know, the 2.0 update kind of just remade the entire game, even. Um, you know, from stats to everything else. It's a completely different game than it was now. Uh, you know, like, even six months ago, it's a completely different game. Uh, so it definitely, you know, these do very much deserve like a and i would dub it like a re-review not like a okay this is you know the review this is a re-review this is us revisiting the game now that it's like fixed this is a more fair rating for the current state of the game but i don't want it to deter the fact that this game released as a broken buggy disgusting mess that nobody should have paid for day one you know (laughs) You know, those both should be, like, up there as, like, honest opinions from day one to day, like, 120, you know? Like, okay, side-by-side comparison. That would be an appropriate way to visit them. But at the same time, like, it makes the reviewer's job a lot harder, have to go back through and potentially replay a, at least in, like, No Man's Sky or Cyberpunk's, you know, realm. Those are huge games those were 120 hour games that you would have to go back through and re-review and that kind of isn't fair to the reviewer either (laughs) i don't know i i really don't it's it's hard to really judge that you know (laughs) um and that's fair i i think it was just more discussion we had in the community and i think like uh, at least among the active members of the community, I can see re-reviews being done, and they'll do that regardless. But I guess I always just wondered, like with certain games like this, which just earned a bad reputation at the start, like not all of them like really get the credit for the developers going out of their way to make it better. Oh, later. yeah, and they but do. at the same time, yep. Yeah, but at the same time, it's ar- arguable that we shouldn't encourage the idea of releasing a game in a state to just fix it later. It should just be as good as possible at the start. But I guess there is a part of me that always feels like in, in anything you release, regardless of like what medium or quality, there are things you learn from it. And it's like how things it, you could have made it better. And games are in 
almost a unique way compared to like, well, actually not even because movies do get re-releases and remakes and stuff. Uh, but games, I think, especially just with the culture built around it, that you can fix things uh, later on. I mean, sure, certain core things have to be there just because they're fundamental to the game. But other things, you can make things better. And uh, in some ways, I feel like encouraging that without um, taking away that the initial sales or the initial release should be quality would be the ideal format. Because, I don't know, I just like that the this developer of this huge IP were actually listening to people and were like, okay, this is what you guys want. We're going to put it in. And I think I'd like it if other developers uh, consider doing the same. Oh, absolutely. So you were talking about like how packed October is. GX has, or Opera GX has this nice little GX corner page. Um, uh, yes, I, it does. True. So uh, Assassin's Creed Mirage, uh, you have a Sword Art Online game because, of course, you need a 27th one of those. Uh, Detective Pikachu, Forza, which even if I'm not a racing game fan, I'd be stupid if I didn't recognize that that's a huge franchise. You have that Lords mm-hmm. of the Fallen uh, game that's uh, Souls-like, and everybody knows that people love their masochistic game. Uh, <laughs> you have uh, the Super Mario Brothers Wonder, Spider-Man, and it, the Metal Gear Solid Master Collection Volume 1 coming out. You also have Ghost Runner 2, which was a huge little indie darling getting a sequel, and Alan Wake 2 coming out, you know, all within this month, and that is insane to think about. Um, and November also was having some good-looking titles here with uh, the new Yakuza game coming out. I guess Like a Dragon is what they're going with now. You have yeah, eight, I mean, eight. I think that's like the original title. They just kind of stick with it. You have the remake of Super Mario RPG. Ah, uh, uh, yeah. And a 97th Persona 5 game because the world needed another one of those. Yeah. <laughs> Sega will milk those IPs. Uh, right. Atlas, I guess, more specifically. Whatever. But why not just do a Persona 6 at this point, guys? I mean, have you seen all the spinoffs for Persona 4? And even Persona 3, I think, has so many versions that I actually had to call my Shin Megami Tensei friend to be like, dude, I need your help to figure out which one of these I'm supposed to be playing here. Because I don't know (laughs) anything. That's fair. Uh, But, like, Jesus Christ. It's like with Persona, for example, like when Strikers came out, I'm like, oh, this looks like a cool spinoff. And then like my friend told me, he's like, no, don't. It's like a sequel. I'm like, what do you mean it's a sequel? <laughs> this doesn't even look like Persona. <laughs> it's a Muso. I can't, let me... Canon Muso. Who does uh, it? <laughs> Literally who? Even Fire Emblem is like, we're like Nintendo does their Muso games. It doesn't make them canon. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but like, like a Persona is it's a sequel. What? Why do no, this? That Persona canon is Shin Megami Tensei canon in general. It's just crazy. This make it stop. <laughs> I, okay. When Sonic fans complained about split timeline back when that was a thing, I'm like, it wasn't that hard. We had like two of them. <laughs> now, look at every other series. Zelda has like three at least. Well, Zelda I don't didn't even, even know have... where the Breath of the Wild series even goes into those timelines. Uh, do you would have like to ask the... Red. <laughs> that's, his, that's his wheelhouse. We'll have Red here for one of these gaming streams someday. Uh, he is at work. I just was asking him, like, what time he wants to film Chainsaw Man. Uh, but, like, it's it's funny, though, because Nintendo didn't even set out with, like, a timeline in mind for Zelda originally, and they just took what the fans were like, yeah, that looks okay, cool, we'll go with that, and then they've just built off of that now that it's so big. I mean, I don't blame them for that, honestly. Zelda, I feel like, was not one of those games where they really needed a timeline. They were just, like, they had an idea, and then they're like, we're just going to do this idea just in different ways on different art styles, and it kind of works. But I guess the idea of a timeline at least allows some justification for kind of repeating the f- same formula <laughs> again yep. and again. Because as much as we make fun of other franchises for releasing yearly sports games or Assassin's Creed games, especially Assassin's Creed games, hey. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, Nintendo is like not innocent of that at all. No. I I have a guilty pleasure spot for Assassin's Creed, but Jesus fucking Christ, they need to stop. I'm hoping Mirage is good, though, because I bought Mirage. 
I own like so many Assassin's Creed games through like the Ubisoft store that I just have not played. <laughs> just because I think I'll get to this one day. Uh, you you could theoretically I uh, say this with all the love in my heart. You could probably just skip Valhalla. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I I'll probably skip through most of them honestly. I'll just pick whichever ones ultimately because I tried playing from one and going forward. And one I'm like, has aged nah. like milk. <laughs> yeah, I I love. But, I, I mean, a lot of series do that. Like I did try doing the same with Fallout. Honestly, I was I had like on GOG the old Fallout games, and I'm like, cool. Let me get into this series everyone likes, and I just played Fallout One, and I was like, I don't. What is this? <laughs> you're valid for that all of us are like they, they need to remaster these games at this point because they they run and look like ass now um yep i i i have like for christmas last year andrew who used to do the jojo uh games or jojo videos um with red bought me um prototype because i i have been wanting to play prototype uh and he just gifted them because they were on my steam wish list and I, they won't even run on my computer because the compatibility issues. And I tried running them in God, compatibility mode, happens. and it still is like, nope. We're just going to boot to the title screen and put it in like a little tiny window the size of a Discord call screen, and it's like, no, we're just going to stop there. So I had to go and get them for the PS4 to play through them. <laughs> it just sucks. <laughs> yeah, it does. I mean, like we just talked about game preservation. And like playing older games like on newer computers should not be this difficult. It really shouldn't. Because uh, I can understand like certain like you know like if something's on like the DS or 3DS, if you don't have like the proper hardware, you're not going to necessarily get the full experience because it involves like having the camera and the, the 3D and, and the, the touch, touch screens, screen. like and all that. Mm-hmm. So yeah. all that I can understand. There's a certain things with like you can only do things with comparable hardware but just being able to run the game is like a bare minimum yep i could play oh, actually freaking, that did i could play freaking oh, overlord which is the same age as prototype one on my pc and it runs on the same technology and architecture i should be able to play prototype but i can't <laughs> i was gonna say look that was one other theory i'd heard floating around for uh a sequel to the Switch was just that maybe they'll just go back to doing uh, dual screen devices with the idea being that Nintendo has, you know, been releasing their old libraries through very strange methods, but like one of them that they're going to have some trouble with is going to be like the DS and the 3DS games, which are like dual screen and everything. So it's like, what's a good way to do that without just remaking the games? And that's just releasing another kind of dual screen device. Basically, kind of like doing what they did with the Wii U, but better, I guess. You know, I'd be okay with that, actually, because that, that was something that uh, we talked about. And I think at, like, the end of the Mission Heroes of Core family video we did the other day is, like, when that store just went down, like, we lost hundreds of thousands of games overnight uh, if you didn't yeah. have them downloaded. And that makes, you know, a massive dump of lost media there and that's something that i absolutely hate but if they were to do that that would be perfect actually and i would be 100 percent okay with that there's also yeah, and then that new device could just be yeah. like their be all end all of everything they had well minus some things like virtual boy i guess but i'm sure it. they could find a way to labo up a virtual boy even no what actually that works so yeah bring that too <laughs> So, so I know you said you wanted to keep this under two hours. Um, what other topics did you find? There, there was uh, one other one that I found while we were scrolling through. Um, the I was scrolling back through the general gaming because we dumped a lot of the stuff in the Discord. Um, there was one yeah, we mass- join the Discord for gaming discussions like this. <laughs> there was one massive breach here recently, and a ransomware group has breached uh, all of Sony systems. Oh, that, man, how did I forget that? That was the other big thing that happened recently that I'm like, okay, so you're announcing your retirement right after this. Okay, then. Yeah. There's a lot going on at Sony where it's like, we need a full game. <laughs> so this is the second time that this has happened uh, to this degree. And the last time we had this happen, do you remember what happened to the, the Sony emphasis? Oh, you're not a Sony gamer, so you probably don't. Uh, this happened. Uh, I doubt it. 
There was I a, remember it happened before, but I don't remember what the consequence was. So there was a whole network live uh, shutdown of PSN. This came out right around the time Mortal Kombat 9 and Modern Warfare 2 dropped. So it was a huge time in, of like completely reworking the network, trying to patch all these holes, and just driving a massive like okay, we need to fix this shit now so everything is offline. You had to, you know, go back through and find out if your credit card got stolen. You had to go back through and make sure, like, none of your information was out there. This is how my identity kind of pseudo got stolen back in the day. So that was a whole f***ing rabbit hole of hell for a lot of Sony gamers. Um... So there was just a massive file just floating around with like credit card and info addresses, names, all of it unprotected on the dark web. Um, and it was a nightmare for Sony. And the way they made up for it to consumers was they gave them like, you know, a bunch of free games and yada, yada, yada. I just find it really convenient from a hacker's perspective that this happened right around the time they were in the lot announcing like the price hike for PlayStation Plus as well. So it, it kind of makes me wonder what guys this uh this group was doing this under. Was this like uh like a, a s sort of like white hat hacker like hey, we want to let you know this is a stupid thing or if this is like a you know nefarious like hey, we're going to sell all of this yeah, like back in the day. Based on what I saw in like Spawn Wave, which is like my morning game show now, there's always like some YouTube channel I follow until they die off where they give me gaming news in the morning because I can't keep track of everything myself. Right. Uh, they said that this group seems to be asking for money. So I'm pretty sure they are not good people. Lovely. Love that. Absolutely fantastic. So I'm glad I no longer have the credit card that's attached to that system. <laughs> I guess that's yeah, one. That's good. I guess that's I'm one. glad I just don't own a PlayStation uh, device. I guess that's the uh the good side of all of my credit cards getting stolen on door was I, I had to you know like replace them and also I switched banks. So <laughs> that's yeah, fun. So I guess for everyone out there who is while well, still listening, thank you. But also, like, keep an eye on your credit card information if yeah. you had that. Uh, so usually, when I don't they, think Sony's going to pay anything. I'll be fuck honest. no, they're not. They're absolutely not. They're going to be like, okay, go ahead. We'll just scrub the network and have people re-enter their payment info. Cool. And realistically, from a business perspective, I, I kind of agree with that, you know. Don't pay the ransom. Yeah, I mean, they really shouldn't because you can't negotiate with terrorists, as the old saying goes. Yeah, and this is like cyber terrorism. Um, Pretty much. I do find uh, it funny, though. Like, all of this happened, and then he's announcing his retirement. Uh, all, yeah, all in and I'm glad you brought it up because I totally forgot that was the other big thing that happened, which I, is the thing with the timing of... His retirement that makes me think, you know what? CEOs, they don't just be like, you know, I'm tired of making money. You know how much money I'm making? I don't think I want to make that anymore. I, I don't I'm need, just going to live my life. I don't need an eighth yacht out there in the Caribbean. Uh, I can retire and play my PlayStation VR 2 is what he was saying. I'm like, yeah, yeah, you, you're going to play the PlayStation VR 2, the $500 headset that you want for your $500 console. Yeah, I'm absolutely going to go out and buy this $500 headset for a $500 console that I just got this year. Yeah, absolutely, when there's, like, two games on it that I would play. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, VR gaming was, like, a whole other thing, I guess, we didn't talk about. And I really thought Sony, because, like, the um, the PC side of things, there were, like, a couple different competitors, but they never made, like, the biggest waves. I always thought Sony would be the one to kind of, like, bring it to more people. But the way they're doing it, is just so stupid that it's definitely not going to happen through them because PSVR 2, I mean, by itself, that's just kind of silly, but they're not even making it like backwards compatible to my knowledge. Nope. But like other games and it's like, okay, so everyone who invested in like the old PSVR is just screwed, like even more so than the people who bought into like your consoles. <laughs> that's great but like on top of that it's like well why would someone invest in your psvr 2 when psvr 3 is likely just going to do the same thing like that just makes 
no sense to me. Um, and you know what? It's funny. At some point, I thought VR technology might get to the point where even I would consider getting it, but it still hasn't quite got there. There hasn't been a game that's like really pushed me to think of it. And like even with, with Sony, I just can't trust them <laughs> anymore, like with what they're doing. And like with the other companies, it's like, well, okay, these are all games on PC I could play without VR. And the ones I could play with with VR uh, don't look that amazing. <laughs> so I'll, I'll say like even as somebody that's not a big fan of Horizon, like that was the one that looked kind of cool just because of like the fluid yeah, of did. combat. Um, and that, and I, I did have a, a Quest Two for a while, and I sold it um, like last year when I uh, got hurt. You just weren't using it, right? It was just sitting there, yeah. I'm just like, okay. Well, it was it was like threefold. I wasn't using it. I didn't have room in my apartment at the time, and it was like, you know, right when I got injured, and I'm like, I'm out of money, and I'm not having any, you know, work because I have a broken arm and have to go to physical therapy, and I have to pay for that somehow because also my company that I got was working for at the time wasn't paying my insurance, even though I was still technically employed with them. So physical therapy is fucking what? expensive. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, I, I'm still dealing with that. Um, yeah, physical therapy is okay, expensive. Wow. Uh, so I'm yeah. just like, I need, I need to pay, for, I need to pay for this uh, visit to kind of, you know, get back to work. So this is sitting here, and I know I can make some money off of it. So I'm gonna wipe my account off of it and sell it because it's just sitting collecting dust. <laughs> and uh, that's just the thing. There's just like not enough content to like support it, and it not enough like really breakout content for I think it to really blow up, even though it's gotten bigger than I expected during the last couple of years, but probably yeah. due to like the pandemic. It's still not like to the point where I think uh, like even with like mobile gaming, which most gamers don't consider like real games, like they are making crazy amounts of money. So that doesn't really matter what gamers think. Yeah. But VR just like hasn't even gotten to like console point yet so yeah i i enjoyed half-life alex i enjoyed a couple other games like blade and sorcery stuff like that if i had more room in my apartment right now i would probably invest in like um you know maybe the quest 3 or even though i hate meta as a company um i might you know involve like the valve index because it's a better you know thing but i don't have room for like the light towers and all the stuff that goes into the technology here so like it wouldn't really have enough depth of field to capture it properly and that's the downside to that technology really that's what made the quest like that middle ground for me is like cool you know it was you know something i just plug right into my computer you know finagle like you know kind of jerry rig it to where we're gonna you know pip out into like steam vr and just you know play these other games that aren't you know on the quest platform but have to have yeah. a workaround to a workaround to a workaround also was just a major inconvenience too and of itself so i'm just like fuck it i don't care there's not enough to keep me invested in it um yeah vr needs like its own standalone device that has a good library behind it mm -hmm. and that requires a lot of money to be invested which i don't uh, i guess none of the other current uh, big manufacturers are doing for whatever reason I, I mean, it was it was cool to experience VR porn as well. I'll, I'll give it that. <laughs> yeah, probably was. <laughs> but other than uh, that, like, it, it was just, it's a gimmick. I, I It was a fun gimmick for a while, but it was a gimmick. Yep, just like 3D was for, during that time period. How often did you use the 3D mode on your 3DS? Like, uh, for certain games, I actually it was pretty decent, but for a lot of others, they just didn't even bother. So I stopped bothering too. That's exactly. just kind of how that went. Like, and plus, I think for me, though, I also bought like the new 3DS. Um, like, I waited for that, which mm -hmm. was, again, one of the reasons I waited on the Switch because it always was a smart investment for me to do so. <laughs> but like with the new 3DS, the 3D was way more stable than the old one. Right? Oh, yeah, so, absolutely. And because of that, I actually tried to use the 3D a bit more. But by the time, of course, the new 3DS came out, like Nintendo was comfortable releasing the 2DS, which is like it's just a DS that can play 3DS games. Yep. It's like no one's using the 3D. They knew that. I, I, um, I'm literally but, debating on just buying a, a old like 2DS XL and just modding the hell out of it just for the funsies at this point. Not a bad idea, honestly, especially if, like, the next console isn't, like, backwards compatible at all. 
Uh, but if it is, I don't know. Might be at least worth waiting to see if it is. Yeah. Um, but I did want to say one other thing I forgot to bring up um, when we were talking about like uh, the other manufacturers for consoles, and we talked about like how Apple in their entry into the gaming space. Like I will say, I checked my subscriptions because Vex did his so I went through mine as well just see yeah. like, what am I still subscribed to and like one of the things I am still subscribed to as an iPhone uh, user is Apple Arcade and because Apple has admittedly invested a good amount of money into that and like gotten some pretty decent IP uh, they aren't talked about as much but I think they have like some good developers behind them and if they really want to develop like a device just with apple arcade alone they could get like a a decent starting point if they also had some launch titles to go with whatever device that they um are doing on top of that did it they have the creator of final fantasy make a game for them too yeah yeah they did that game um okay i'm blanking on the name i'm gonna look it up right now because i did want to recommend that but yeah, that game I've played and it's really good. I think the reason I stopped is because like with most RPGs, I got stuck on a boss and I'm like, well, I'm going to do something else now. <laughs> and that's just a me problem. That's not on the game. The game is actually really incredible. What I liked about it most uh, specifically and uh, the things they advertised were the art style being like diorama based, which is really cool. And of course the... Um, The visuals and music were also really nice. But what I liked that they added to this game uh, was the uh, this uh, mechanic where you could kind of like skip enemies. But rather than just like, oh, you know, Pokemon repel system where you can just ignore enemies for a short period of time and then use the item again in order to, um, you know, stop fighting enemies it's a storage system where the enemies are just kind of stored in like a box and then at some point you kind of reach a limit oh yeah fantasian that's what it's called yeah so you can store those enemies in a box and then when you reach at any point and before you reach storage capacity you have to like fight the bosses uh or fight those enemies all at like once and it's a nice like system to be like okay i don't feel like fighting these mobs but I'll have to fight them eventually. And I think if you collect a good amount, you get well rewarded for that as well because the battle system kind of works great in terms of like fighting multiple enemies at once. So yeah, that I think is probably one of their best stuff, but there's also some other pretty good smaller titles um, in the service as well. Yeah, it's called Fantasian um, apparently, and it might be coming to PC. Yeah, I recently heard about that, which I'm glad because it kind of was kept being a disservice by being stuck on Apple, but I genuinely am surprised because I feel I felt like this was one of those titles that uh, Apple themselves sponsored. So I'm surprised it's going to other places. But, you know, maybe that's just what Apple is going to do. Maybe they'll just like have games that will come to their systems, but then release on others like Xbox and other well, just platform holders, I guess. Yeah, it, it's kind of like a time exclusivity. Now kind of thing maybe who knows um and you know i'm also hoping mist walker gets to do more stuff with the success of this game because they put a lot of passion and energy oh yeah it's it looks definitely phenomenal it had me almost wanting to buy an apple product it's yeah i mean that's saying something (laughs) honestly (laughs) Um, uh, but yeah, I definitely recommend getting it on PC once it releases because it was a good game. Like I said, the only reason I stopped is because I just got stuck. And I, also because my phone is like a couple years old now and can only hold so many apps and other things at once. So I have to just regularly delete things anyway. You, you got to succumb to the gotcha of life, you know? Uh, yeah, that also. I just got really into gotcha games. I mean, it makes sense. Like when you're using your phone as a gaming uh, device in general, you you tend to fall down the gotcha rabbit hole. I mean, I just installed a Honkai Star Rail um, and Genshin again, and I hate myself for that. Um, I mean, yeah. Genshin. I think what stopped me from getting into that is just because, like, on my computer for some reason, it runs like garbage, and on my phone, it runs but takes up all my space. So it's like, okay, cool. I can't get addicted to this one. But it's, it's like probably, Star Rail. 
It's probably uh, a yeah, good it's thing. It's probably a good thing. <laughs> um, it is. But with Hawkeye Star Rail, like that was a solid game. It's just that uh, it's very similar to like a standard RPG on mm-hmm. your phone, which is nice. But at that point, I'm like, I'd rather just play an RPG than a gotcha version of an RPG. Because I feel like the gotcha games I really enjoy are just like very simple to play. I can just put a little time each day in and then cumulatively have it be like my most played thing all year <laughs> just by accident. Rather than this is a game where I could put in hours at a time and it's like I don't want to really do that. <laughs> it's just gonna drain my batteries, drain my stuff, and it's I got other stuff to do. Yeah. That's not how phone games should be. Uh, I think that's why fair. I play Nike and Blue Archive and stuff instead. I, I like my waifu simulators, so as long as I can get pretty characters, uh, I'm happy. So, um, I mean, yeah. And I, I love the, the freaking Hoyo Lab art style. I don't know why. It's it's always been fascinating to me. It's just I fell out of it for a while, and then uh, a couple of my friends were like, you need to get in on this. I'm like, do I really need to get in on it? Oh, sell me on it. And they're like, they showed me one character. I'm like, okay. Uh, you, you sold me. That's all you had to show me was a, a tatted woman with uh, attitude and a pair of giant tits. Uh, that's all it took. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my best friend, he saw like one of the Genshin characters' designs, and he just got really obsessed with it. But he just doesn't play <laughs> the games, which I think is good for him, because whether he knows it or not, he's like a bit of an addictive personality, <laughs> I've noticed. I've like, yeah. known him for like 18 years, so I, I, he would be very susceptible to. I'm wailing he, to get this one character, and I never get it. <laughs> yeah, the, that exactly <laughs> that. You got you got to be like really responsible with gaming. Although I will say, Nikkei's gotten me to spend way more money than I really should have. I, I spent I think two hundred dollars trying to get Fenty when I first played it, and that's when I'm like, I have a problem. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> So I, I I have those those personality traits and I've openly admitted to it, but it's it's fine it's fine I could afford it at the time. But yeah, uh, at this point we've just kind of accepted that companies can take advantage of this. There's a whole industry. Yup. Yup. And it, it's so, not a good thing. <laughs> so we hit like the two hour mark. I know you said you wanted to kind yeah. of cut it off around now. Yeah. So anything else, or you want to just end it? I think like the the final closing points of this is we'll probably end up cycling back to this uh, topic as we find out more because we're going back into the FTC hearings I think next week. Um, yeah, yeah, and we'll have like that final decision because I think we're the f- in an odd American way we are. It's not the American way at all because we usually love big corporations by big corporations. Um, but we've been the big holdout on this one. So once we find out if we are uh, accepting... I mean, the CMA was too. Yeah, but who cares about Europe? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's the UK specifically. But Because uh, but, um, yeah. I think Europe, like the EU, was like cool with it. And then, like I said, South America, like Brazil was one of the first countries to be like, yeah, this is chill. But like. Uh, I, I still find them picking Ubisoft of all things and for the CMA picking Ubisoft of all things. It's like an okay thing when their streaming isn't all that I good. I don't either. even know how they came to that like arrangement. Like did someone at Microsoft be like, get Ubisoft on the phone. They're going to save our deal. And then someone else had to be like, I uh, don't even know what's happening anymore. <laughs> you know what? It's a phone call. I'll make a phone call. Uh, get Eves on the phone. We got a good rapport with him. Fuck it, I don't care. Let's get this over with. Is probably how that conversation went. Uh, but uh, man, it is just weird. I still don't understand how it solves any problems, but it's funny. Like Ubisoft is just gonna have the rights to streaming COD, like on uh, yeah, just like specifically that, and yeah. that's gonna be like okay, Microsoft no longer has a monopoly. It's like I don't think that's how monopolies work, but okay. I, I mean, our entire. Uh, country is one monopoly after another so it's fine whatever we just accept it here that's that's what i find so weird about this whole ordeal is like apple disney warner brothers all of these big entertainment giants you know are monopolies and of themselves and we're just arguing over one gaming corporation taking up another gaming corporation and on top of that it's like there are other gaming corporations that are getting away with way more. Like Embracer. Tencent. 
Yeah. And like these mobile games are like way more profitable than anything Microsoft's doing. But at the same time, I feel like uh, the explanation that we're getting about the FTC is like they're just cracking down more in general. Like we saw, I think it was Red who posted this on my timeline, but uh, I think they're saying they're like getting on to Amazon for yeah. their practices. That's how I found and out about it was Red's Epic. tweet. <laughs> yeah. I mean, good on Red for being the politically active one in our group, giving us <laughs> insights into these things. But yeah, and then the FTC also was like finding Epic for some stuff they were doing. It so was like, uh, too easy to buy V bucks or for kids to buy V bucks. Now they have like a yeah, e and honestly, that is a good thing for them to like find yeah. Epic for because they were definitely profiting on the stupidity of children. <laughs> oh, honestly, and the stupidity of people like me wanting almost every skin but the My Hero ones. <laughs> So, I mean, it makes sense for them to do that. So the, I think the FTC is just like whoever is in charge of that is just like, we need to do our jobs more seriously. I think that's just what's going on. And it's I, less that they actually like are like, man, Microsoft is going to rule the gaming industry with Activision Blizzard. They're it, just like, no, we, this is just our job. We got to do something about these things. And I'm kind of glad we're getting to that point. But I, I think we just, as Americans in general, we just accepted it. But... I'm glad we're getting a little bit more activity out of it, but we'll we'll cycle back to this and probably some more gaming news because this was fun. This was really fun. Oh man. yeah, I uh, mean we talked about a lot. I wasn't even sure how much we were going to be able to, but now nah, this was a good. This is a good lengthy, lengthy one, yeah. But until this was just like the two of us. If we have more people on next time, I'm pretty sure they'll have their own topics they want to discuss. Yeah, I I'm know. sure as soon as we end this, I'm going to find out something that happened in the gaming industry. But I'm like, what? Well, we could have had a whole like half hour discussion on this. Well, we can add it to the next one. I know Luke wants to talk about South Park and a couple other things for the next one. Oh, yeah. Pokemon, he said. Yeah. Yeah. So until that video, peace.